There we go. Um, thank you so much for hosting me here tonight. A big thank you to the Geothermal Association of Ireland and to the Geological Survey as well for giving us the space to give this talk today. And thank you all for coming out um, to listen to me witter on for about 40 minutes or so on geothermal. So, yeah, so as Rick said, I've been in New Zealand um, up until about January this year uh, working with, um, the G, uh, with the Geological and Nuclear Sciences Survey of um, New Zealand, which is kind of the equivalent of the Geological Survey there, I guess. And in that role, I worked mainly on development of their geothermal energy research um, and linked uh, very heavily with industry and in helping them refine the exploration and utilization of their geothermal resources over there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what New Zealand's geothermal sort of uh, resources are, um, what they do with geothermal in New Zealand, and it's very broad and very uh, very entertaining, some of what they get up to over there. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how they're using it um, for energy because it's quite a huge portion of their um, energy output for their country. Um, so I've titled the talk The Hidden Depths of New Zealand's Geothermal Wonderland. And I've used that term wonderland um, because it is quite an appropriate um, word for a lot of what we see in the geothermal features in New Zealand. Um, it is probably one of the rare places um, globally where you see some of the exp geothermal expressions that you see um, from uh, anything from the hot pools to the uh, geysers to geothermal mineral expressions at surface. Uh, some of these things are um, easily comparable with what you would see at Yellowstone National Park or what you would see in Iceland, for example. Um, and they're definitely on par, if not probably, in my opinion, a lot more prettier and better <laughs> than what we see globally. <laughs> so it is a wonderland. And Wonderland has actually generated um, a huge tourism industry around uh, geothermal exploration and geothermal tourism in the country. This is a, a photo here of um, the edge of Champagne Pool in the Waitapu region in, uh, in the TVZ of New Zealand. Um, you can see all of the uh, orange and yellow mineral sul uh, sulfur mineralization around the edge of the lake, which precipitates out of all this uh, geothermal water there. So this is one part of one park that they let tourists want, uh, walk around and explore so they can inform themselves on what geothermal is. They can um, take in all these beautiful colours and the beautiful landscapes that are generated in these geothermal areas and also smell a lot of H2S, which is not <laughs> great, but it comes with the package. Um, but like I said, it's a huge business over there. It's um, approximately two and a half million visit these geothermal areas per year in New Zealand. It provides a huge amount of local um, employment uh, and uh, through the tourism uh, businesses in these non-rural, uh, not sorry, non-urban areas of New Zealand. A lot of the geothermal systems are actually hosted um, in very, um, very out of the way uh, towns and regions of the centre of the North Island of New Zealand. So it's great because it brings all this um, local employment and local opportunity. Um, and altogether, when it's been calculated, and I think the last time they tried to work out roughly how much it was worth was 2014, 2015. It was the tourism industry based around geothermal was worth about 206 million dollars, New Zealand dollars, to the regional economy. So geothermal, um, bar even me beginning to talk about why it's useful for energy or anything else, already the tourism um, is the tourism and the money generated from tourism in New Zealand is huge just because of these natural uh, features that are there. It also has a huge cultural significance. So. The, uh, the Maori people were the first people to um, arrive in New Zealand on boats from the Polynesian diaspora. And um, when they arrived there, they were the first people to discover a lot of these geothermal features. And as a result, a lot of these geothermal features became incorporated into their day-to-day -day lives, into their tribal lives, and have a lot of cultural <coughs> significance for them. So for the Maori tribes, they would use the geothermal waters for washing, bathing, cooking, and preserving food. A lot of ceremonial uses and they even had healing applications for some of the geothermal muds that they would find in these areas. Um, they also used the geothermal minerals as paints. They used them to uh, preserve wood and to make dyes for their clothing as well. So uh, even at the very beginning of um, the human occupation of the island of New Zealand, geothermal minerals, geothermal waters were being used for human benefit. Um, and just gratuitous photos now of how beautiful some of these places are. So I mentioned Champagne Pool before. This is a step back looking at the broader scale of the pool and the yellow colour of the waters, the, the minerals that come within this. Um, they all get really interesting names as a Champagne Pool because there's a lot of gas fizzing up in it and it looks like champagne in a glass. 
They have other ones called um, Devil's Pond, where it's just this real violent green coloured water that's very still. Uh, there's a whole other area, the previous slide I showed you with all the mud bubbling, that's called Hell's Gate, because there's all this steam and mud that bubbles up. And it always reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Labyrinth when you were kids. Yeah, it reminds me of that scene in Labyrinth when they're stepping across the stones. Yeah, it always reminds me of this. <laughs> And, uh, and they just have these beautiful expressions, beautiful mineral expressions um, littered across the countryside. Um, so on the far uh, right there, this is um, uh, a geyser, a bit of a steam geyser chimney, and you can see a lot of sulfur mineralization around the edges of this. It's this bright yellow mineral made of sulfur. And then on the left here, we can see sinter terraces, which is colloidal silica just depositing out of um, the rivers, the geothermal waters as they flow through rivers and flow over shallow surfaces. And these are very unique features that are only found in a few places around the globe. So it's beautiful to be able to go and witness them and see them yourself. So moving now to the power element of geothermal in New Zealand, and it is quite significant in New Zealand. So this is a photo here of uh, looking out over the bore field of the Waraki geothermal field. So this is the one that's really close to the Taupo Lake, which is at the centre of the North Island. And uh, this is just looking out over all the pipe infrastructure that they put in place to tap the uh, geothermal waters and steam from the wells that they channel then to the power station, which is off in the distance there. Uh, the Waraki geothermal field was actually the first geothermal field that uh, was drilled and launched in New Zealand, and that actually began back in 1958. So New Zealand um, just missed out, actually, on being the first country to use geothermal energy to generate electricity. The Italians beat them to it, I think, just by a few years at a... Uh, um, with their own resources. Um, and in geothermal in New Zealand, the reason they actually decided to start looking at this research and develop it was because a lot of what they had been using for their electricity supply up until this point had been through hydroelectricity from the dams. They had had two years before 1958 where the rainfall had been really low. So the dam uh, electricity produ production had dropped significantly and they needed something to pick up the slack. So this is why they thought they would invest and develop some of these geothermal resources. So that's actually how it got started over there. So they just moved from one renewable to another. And I haven't got data, unfortunately, that goes all the way back to 1958, but I do have about the last 15 uh, years worth of uh, data here. So just a real simple graph, hopefully you can follow there. Along the bottom, we've got dates from 1990 all the way to 2015. And then along the uh, y-axis there, we've got energy in petajoules. Um, I'll just try and put petajoule into some sort of useful context because it's just a word that people use, scientists use. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's you know, better than the next one I'll use in the next slide. So a petajoule is worth about 277 kilowatts per hour. The average house in Ireland uses 20,000 kWh per year. So technically, if you look at how many petajoules New Zealand produced from geothermal energy in 2015, which is up past 100 there, uh, last year, geothermal power in New Zealand could have powered 1.5 million Irish homes um, here in this country if we were using it like that. So that just kind of gives you a perspective of how much energy they're producing from their fields over there. And you can see it's significantly grown over time as they've realised the potential of geothermal and started investing more and more into the exploration, into the utilisation, the drilling and the, um, and the technologies they use to extract the heat as well. So we get a massive spike actually around about 2004, 2005, and then I enter the scene somewhere around here, but really <laughs> climbs up. So, uh, Just to put that into context as well with the other renewables in New Zealand, which are also a huge part of their energy production, you can see the other graphs here that are much, much steadier increase or much lower uh, increases over the years. Hydro is there in the blue line, and you can see it's been a huge part of New Zealand's electricity uh, picture for a long, long time, and it hasn't really... Um, increased or come up since um, they actually began utilising it way back in the 1900s. Um, you see a bit of an increase in the biofuels that are being used over the last 15 years, not too much. I mean, a lot of biofuel energy in New Zealand is a result of uh, wood burning, actually, and their forestry industry, so they do a lot of wood burning stoves and that sort of thing. And then you can see that wind energy is now starting to become um, a little bit more um, prominent on the electricity scene in New Zealand as well. But really, when you compare all of them to how quickly New Zealand's geothermal um, industry has grown, they just don't hold a candle to them, which is quite impressive, given that it's only really been in the last less than 10 years that this increase has happened. So putting it again into a slightly different context here, this is the total, oh, sorry, this, this is the total percentage of uh, energy. Did it actually move there? Sorry. I'm gonna, no, that's fine. 
to put it again, just to put the renewable aspect of New Zealand's geothermal energy into context with what we have here in Ireland. Um, the, if you look at this graph here, now we're dealing with this lovely um, unit of measurement called MTOE, which is um, million, uh, million ton of oil equivalent. Um, uh, I couldn't get access to the data from the Irish um, data sets with the SEAI mm -hmm. to convert it to something a bit more standard. <laughs> so I took the New Zealand data sets and converted that to the million tons of oil equivalent, just so I could have a nice comparison here between New Zealand and Ireland in terms of the renewable com uh, outputs. So these bright green colours here are the, ver the various um, categories of renewable energy that are contributing to New Zealand's geothermal um, needs and supplies. And this larger one here that seems that has increased quite significantly over the last five, six years, this is the geothermal component. If you look at Ireland, the same green colour here is uh, Ireland's contribution to its total energy requirements from renewable energy. So significantly less than New Zealand. And we do have to bear in mind, oh, sorry, New Zealand has um, a much higher um, uh, available availability of resources there for its renewable energy. Um, talking about their availability of resources in New Zealand, they actually have a lot of different ways in which they use it as well. So it's not just electricity production that they use energy for, or geothermal energy for in New Zealand. Although it is a big part of it, and currently they have eight drilled um, uh, geothermal fields or geothermal resources in New Zealand that they have actively that actively uh, produce energy from power stations. And out of those eight, um, out of those of those eight, kind of make up roughly about half of what they could drill in terms of conventional resources. And we're not even beginning to think then of what would happen if we decided to drill just an extra kilometer or two um, in terms of what heat and temperature fluids we could acquire from then. So. We're really still only um, utilising a portion of what geothermal has to offer in New Zealand in terms of electricity generation. But like I said, it's used for a whole plethora of other, of other interesting applications. So um, they use it for timber drying in the pulp mills and paper drying as well, um, particularly at Caro Geothermal Field, which is up sort of near the Bay of Plenty uh, on the Pacific coast that uh, does a lot of work around timber drying. And they actually helped in, uh, invest in the geothermal development of that field to access that sort of cascade system. Um, there's a lot of ground source heat pump uh, development in New Zealand, and this is done um, not just uh, at uh, the housing scale, individual houses, but they're also starting to implement these into larger pieces of infrastructure like hospitals and leisure centres. And they're even now starting to try and develop these larger scale district um, type projects that would heat whole uh, areas of a city or a village. Um, if you look at Rotorua Village, which is located within the top of the Conic Zone, pretty much the entire, particularly the older built centre of the city, runs a lot on geothermal heating. A lot of the hotels and hostels there are actually heated by geothermal waters, which is fantastic. Uh, thermoculture is a huge um, business in the geothermal regions of New Zealand. This is uh, everything from rearing prawns and eels and fish that require hotter um, environments to thrive in, and also from anything from greenhouse flowers and foods as well. Uh, it's also used a lot for bathing. There are some exceptional hot pools, both natural and uh, man-made, <laughs> that you can spend a lot of your time in. Uh, which is fantastic, and I really miss those now that I'm back. Um, and surprisingly, they also use it in the brewing industry as well. I think that's a fairly recent development. Um, but one of my favourites, um, and I lived really near this place for probably about three years when I was working there, was um, was the Hooker Prawn <laughs> Park. Uh, <laughs> so this um, was uh, this this place was linked to the Wairaki Geothermal Station actually, and they grew. The, uh, they used um, heat exchangers to heat the waters where they grew these uh, giant Malaysian prawns that required a certain temperature to grow. And used to be able to go down, they would give you a sort of a bit of a stick with a bit of rope on it, and you would dangle these in with a little bait, and you were allowed to fish for large prawns. And whatever you fished, you could then take away and eat it at home. It was pretty cool. I loved going there. <laughs> <laughs> but again, just a really, in, and again, not just building on this thermoculture um, uh, Thing. They also developed this into um, a really successful uh, tourist business um, in the area too. So <coughs> lots of things you can do with New Zealand uh, geothermal. So just to give you a rough idea of sort of the setting for um, where we have our, most of our geothermal in New Zealand. And I've kind of focused here on this is the North Island of New Zealand here. And that might be a little bit, uh, a little bit short sighted because uh, the South Island of New Zealand also has a lot of geothermal potential. And actually just this year, very recently, a uh, paper was published in uh, Nature 
that was looking at the results from the deep drilling that they did on the Alpine Fault, which is along the sort of west coast of the South Island. And they were finding temperatures in the hanging wall of where that of that large fault over there of over 100 degrees centigrade at less than a kilometer's depth. So there is actually huge amounts of potential now for developing geothermal energy on the South Island, which has never been really explored at this point. But most of what we know, or most of what we, has been studied and what is currently operational in New Zealand is located in the North Island. We have one small geothermal electricity field up here called the NAFA field in Northland, which is a little bit of a standout one by itself. But the dominant um, amount of geothermal features and business and industry and power generation is done within the Taupo volcanic zone. So the Taupo volcanic zone, and this is Lake Taupo here at the centre of the North Island, up to the Bay of Plenty here um, on the Pacific coast. Top of volcanic zone, I'll explain a little bit more about this uh, shortly, but it sort of stretches between two very impressive volcanic areas. So from the centre of the island, we, it stretches from a collection of uh, three volcanoes, Mount Tongariro, Mount Narahoe and Mount Ruapehu, which dominate the sort of landscape of the North Island for a large, large area. And this is um, a photo of one of the hikes I did up over um, this region of Mount Narahoe, um, possibly a little bit more famously known as Mount Doom, because that's where they filmed a lot of Lord of the Rings scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see these amazing um, lava flow deposits that have come down out of some of these, um, uh, these volcanoes over time. So the, t the Taupo Volcanic Zone stretches from these volcanoes here all the way to the coast along the Pacific and out into the waters as far as um, what we refer to as White Island, which is this volcanic island that you can see pictured here. So the extent of the, um, the, extent of the top of Volcanic Zone runs in sort of this rough northeast southwest trend, and that's very important, and we'll come back to that later. Um, and there's been all sorts of uh, industries that have been attempted in lots of these areas. Most of it is on the mainland. More interestingly, when you, if you ever get the chance and you get to go to White Island, you can take a boat out to the island and you can do a tour of the geothermal facilities out there, as long as there's not a sort of raised warning level for its volcanic activity, because it's constantly being monitored because it's constantly burping and making all sorts of indications that it's about to do something. But uh, quite interesting when you go, if you ever get the chance, and you do go on this tour out there, um, way back in, I think it was the sort of later 1900s, they attempted to set up a sulfur mining business on the island. And that all ended, I think it was late, fi late 50s, <laughs> early 60s, it all ended when a volcanic lahar killed about 10 of the workers. But what you can still tour now are the remains of the facilities of this sulfur mine and look at all of the um, amazing sort of uh, mineralization and rusted uh, um, machinery and buildings layout. And I mean, it's very interesting to see what uh, the geothermal nature of this volcanic island has done to the man-made structures that were very quickly abandoned. <laughs> so as I was saying, there's, a, there's, an, there's an interesting trend to the way that these geothermal features in the top of the volcanic zone are uh, spatially arranged. They, they have this nice northeast-southwest trend. And you know, it, this is not something that's been unknown to people for a long time, actually. The Maori um, were the first people to really observe this kind of idea of a, an alignment of geothermal features. And you can get this impression from when you look at some of the Maori um, mythology around how the geothermal features in New Zealand formed. So I really hope I have the, the, the guts of this right, because um, uh, the lovely people who, who taught me some of this will string me up if I get it wrong. <laughs> but basically, Maori legend has it that a high priest um, called Natoro Rangi was caught in a blizzard while he was climbing Mount Narahoe, and that was the Mount Doom that I showed you earlier on, so appropriately filmed, I guess. Um, in Hawaii, which is the um, Polynesian diaspora's kind of... Um, Home, a mythological homeland where they all come, come from, the high priest's sisters, Tupupu and Tahuata, heard his prayers and they sent fire from their mythological home across the Pacific Ocean, where it raced from the Bay of Plenty across the land towards the volcanoes that he was climbing. And in the wake of the fire that they sent, they left a path of geothermal fields behind them. So this, I think, is one of these amazing examples where traditional knowledge um, and uh, it, it actually holds um, interesting keys to understanding scientifically what we're looking at um, today, what we're trying to understand in terms of why are the geothermal fields arranged like this? Do they have a pattern that we can observe? And it's been observed not just by scientists today, but it's been observed by natural scientists um, culturally for years and years. So um, they actually have this, this image behind uh, the text here is of the Waraki terraces, which are a um, very beautiful geothermal feature that forms really close to the, the volcanoes. 
And uh, if you uh, go to tour these, you can actually see um, a carving of the high priest himself who guards the entrance to the Waraki uh, terraces here. This is um, the high priest, uh, Matoro Orangi, um, guarding those terraces. So very interesting and um, useful uh, traditional knowledge that can be applied to understanding spatial arrangements of geothermal fields, which I find fascinating. However, there is a slightly more geological reason why <laughs> these features are aligned. So this is a sort of 3D diagram kind of <coughs> cut into the earth so you can have a look and see and understand why we have the top of the volcanic zone as it does. So this is the top of the volcanic zone here. These are the volcanoes on land. White Island is just off the edge of the, the, the block here. And this is the Bay of Plenty. And all of the geothermal features and geothermal fields where industry and power and everything is run from lie mostly within this sort of wedge-shaped pattern. This uh, wedge-shaped sort of area where we get all of this geothermal expression is the result of um, rifting, which is when you take a part of the continental crust and you start to slowly pull it apart so that you create a bunch of normal faults and allow the, crutch, the crust to stretch and thin. And this allows the mantle to rise up underneath it and then gets, um, brings the temperatures and fluids much closer to the surface where they can then be accessed by structures and channel fluid to the surface to create these geothermal resources. And this, all, all this rifting, all this stretching of the crust here is actually a result of a larger plate boundary that occurs just off to the east of the island where you have the Pacific plate subducting and going underneath the Australian Indian plate that the New, Zealand, the New Zealand crust sits on top of. So what we essentially have here is a back arc rift in geological terms, which is a zone of crustal extension that is the result of this plate moving down and underneath causing, causing stretching above it. Uh, in this zone, we have a whole lot of uh, active faults um, that follow this northeast southwest trend. So the whole area here is riddled with lots of small, large scale, small scale, <coughs> large scale uh, faults and fractures that, have all that are all fairly active because there's a lot of seismicity in this area. And it also contains a number of volcanic calderas, which, is a, which have erupted a huge amount of particularly siliclast siliclastic material over time. Actually, the largest one, surprising, well, not surprisingly, maybe, but the largest caldera here is the actual Lake Taupo itself, which is the, on a, an equivalent in size to what we term the supervolcano that supposedly underlies uh, Yellowstone National Park. So New Zealand has its very own supervolcano lying just underneath all of its geothermal resources. So I'm going to move a little bit off from what I talked about in terms of just the broad sort of context of um, New Zealand geothermal and move a little bit into all the really, really cool research and awesome science that's being done uh, um, out there by a lot of the Kiwi scientists and the other scientists who migrated to New Zealand to study, but also by people from all over the world because it is such a fascinating geological region to carry out research. But um, some of the, this, a lot of this is what some of my colleagues have uh, been working on for years, a lot of it, some of, some of which I've been involved in. So I'm going to explain a little bit about some of the more interesting stuff. And this is kind of where um, the hidden depths of um, the talk come into. So I've talked about the geothermal wonderland. The, um, the roots of this wonderland, though, are what we're more interested in in terms of as geologists, as scientists, because we want to understand how this wonderland came to be. And a lot of that relies on understanding what's happening underneath the surface. And it's really difficult to do this, especially in the uh, top of volcanic zone. We don't have a lot of exposure of rock um, of, at the surface. Um, a lot of what we know about the geology um, of the subsurface underneath these geothermal systems comes from actually drilling. We haven't got great seismic surveys that give us really interesting uh, lo uh, looks into the thicknesses of packages and the uh, faults and the structures, and particularly the basement, because the particular rocks that were deposited by all the volcanic eruptions in this area attenuate the seismic signals a lot and you get rubbish you get rubbish results. So we're very limited in what we've been able to do. But this difficulty in trying to characterize what the what the subsurface looks like has driven innovation and driven um, driven new ideas and new technology to be applied to try and understand what it is that we're looking at. So we've had to move past the conventional um, ways of, of investigating the subsurface and try new things. And that's where a lot of the interesting research has come in. So you can see here, um, as I've listed, a lot of the studies that are carried out in the TVZ, they will be focused maybe on one data set or they will have um, a number of different data sets brought together. Um, sometimes uh, data sets you wouldn't expect to bring together as well to try and resolve some of the questions that we have about this region. 
Uh, the geothermal systems are constantly changing over time as well. So this is constantly bringing new data into um, our, our models and our understanding. So we're ob always having to rethink everything we know as new things come to light, as these things evolve over time. <clears throat> And in general, all of the geothermal systems have a, a various amounts of similarity and various amounts of heterogeneity or variability amongst them that provide numerous research topics, or if you're more interested in researching one thing, numerous options to study it in slightly different settings in different fields. So there is a wealth of, of, of research that can be done. So coming back to this idea of hidden depths, um, so I said most of what we understand about the geology of our um, subsurface of our geothermal fields actually comes from drilling um, and we've had very um, you know very limited sort of uh, very limited access to a visualization of what that geology might look like because all we're looking at are these one-dimensional well tracks of the geology that are very spaced out so we've had to do a lot of work around trying to understand um, how to use 3d modeling to develop reasonable and um, reasonable and logical three-dimensional models of the subsurface so here we have, um, this is the Carroll geothermal field, and this was uh, a 3D model that was worked on and published by a colleague of mine, Sarah Milicic, back in 2013. And what she has done here is she has taken all of the well geology from all of the different wells that have been drilled here. This is, she's taken a surface expression here, and you can see Mount Putuaki here in the background, again, another volcano. Um, and she has tried to use um, a software that we call a software that was developed um, alongside uh, some of the scientists at GNS where I worked, um, called Leapfrog, and they specifically designed a module of this software to deal with geothermal um, energy. So this was where we came to a nice blend of geothermal geologists and geothermal researchers and software developers to try and get around how we model these. Um, strange igneous bodies and lava flows within larger scale pyroclastic deposits on top of grey wacky basement that is faulted and structured and fractured in different ways. So it was a really interesting blend of um, software developers and geologists <coughs> who worked side by side to try and develop some uh, new modules to, to be able to generate these beautiful three-dimensional images. Another um, very popular tool that is very quickly becoming the tool of choice for geothermal exploration is what we call magnetotellurics. So magnetotellurics is essentially a really is essentially a, an advanced tool for looking at the resistivity structure of the subsurface. So by by resistivity, um, basically what you're doing by measuring the variations in the resistivity in the subsurface is you're trying to get an idea about the variation in the heat and fluid content within the crust. In, in, in a roundabout kind of way. Um, for a long time, the, um, the sparsity of magnetotelluric stations based at the surface and the lack of access and training in development of the data as well um, meant that there wasn't a lot of work done in this space, but certainly over the last five, if not 10 years, magnetotelluric has really taken off in New Zealand and we're now getting to the point where we're starting to generate really deep um, three-dimensional resistivity images of the, uh, of the uh, top of volcanic zone of specific areas of the geothermal expression as well. So for example, this is two, um, or the, sorry, this is three sections, um, one plan section and two cross sections all intersecting with each other of the, um, the heat and fluid, what we call the heat and fluid structure of up to potentially 10 kilometers depth. And you're starting to lose a little bit of resolution as you go that deep, but what we're starting to see is the areas where we might be getting these upwellings of high fluids and high temperatures towards the geothermal expressions, which you can see dotted close to the surface up here. So what we're really starting to do with this tool is visualize the roots of these geothermal systems, where they're coming from depth and where those are located. Um, and this fantastic paper by uh, Ted Bertrand as well, um, a couple of years ago, um, on their first results from here. Something else that we're also um, quite proud of as well in New Zealand is our ability to, or is some of the stuff that we've developed to specifically look at um, fluid rock interactions in geothermal systems. So if you have a geothermal post rock and you flow a lot of hot fluids and geothermal fluids, which have all sorts of chemistries along them, you get really interesting reactions between those fluids and the rock that they're flowing through. And that will change the chemistry of them in various ways and it will leave behind signatures for us to try and understand what the fluid conditions might have been at the time they were flowing through the rock. What we have here is the natural example of that. So this is an open fracture where the fluids are moving along it and they're interacting with all of these minerals and uh, pieces of the rock in, that they're flowing through and growing, and changing, growing new minerals and changing the minerals that are there. 
what we're trying to do um, and what has been developed in uh, the Waraki Geothermal Research Centre in um, Taupo uh, is a laboratory version of what happens in, in nature. And there's one of these state-of-the-art pieces of equipment that is run by Bruce Mountain um, in GNS. And he takes examples of geothermal reservoir rocks. He has equipment there that is able to flow uh, t different types of geothermal fluids, chemistries and temperatures across these rocks at variable rates to try and understand how the reservoir rocks will react with these different types of fluids and at what rates they react with these different types of fluids. And this is a really groundbreaking piece of, uh, of science that's been done in this space. So the next thing I'll talk about is a research program that was launched about uh, four years ago, I think now. I think this might be its final year. Um, and this is the project called Geothermal Supermodels. And no, it's not those type of supermodels. Everyone gets asked this all the time. Although this is an image from uh, when New Zealand ran its own next top model um, and, uh, competition, and they actually went to Rotorua <coughs> and had their models pose um, in Hell's Gate around all the mud pools and geothermal steam. So I guess there's a link there. <laughs> what it actually is, is a whole research program designed around developing specific computational and numerical modeling that can handle the really diverse and interesting um, functions and processes that occur in geothermal systems. So this is their, their pyramid of their development over time. And basically what they're doing is they're working on the, the fundamentals of understanding the way fluids in, terms, in geothermal fields behave from whether they're single phase, like a gas or a fluid, multi-phase, mixed gas and fluid, or even supercritical uh, conditions where the fluid is behaving in supercritical, it has a supercritical behavior. They're trying to numerically um, model that behavior in order to then bring that information into models that model the flow and the development of a geothermal field over time. So this is very difficult. Not a lot of people have done it before because it is quite um, difficult in terms of understanding thermodynamics and the maths behind some of the flow properties of these crazy geothermal fluids. But this is what this was set up for. And then the idea was they'd be able to bring some of these new fundamental calculations and, and equations into models that are able to cope with things like the mechanical behavior of these geothermal systems, the fluid flow behavior and the chemical behavior of these geothermal systems, and eventually um, what they want to end up with. And what they've done quite a lot of, uh, they've made a lot of progress in doing is coming up with a bunch of validated and verifying modeling tools that can then be used across the world to model um, geothermal systems globally. Um, another great project that has been run out in New Zealand as well, and this is moving very far away from geology now into the realm of microbiology, is a project called the 1000 Springs Project. And this is run by a very um, exceptional researcher, Matt Stott, in GNS Science, um, along with actually another Irish researcher. This is Jean Power here, um, sampling some of the, uh, the, the fluids from the Champagne Pool, um, who will hopefully be returning to us soon. <laughs> Uh, and they have an amazing and ambitious project where they're attempting to sample and categorize the fluid chemistries and the microbiological diversity in 1,000 thermal features across the Tapo Volcanic Zone. They have um, an amazing website that you visit where you can actually interact and play with the uh, biological uh, family structure and um, diversity graphs online and also a great online resource where you can download a lot of the chemical data they've acquired for all of these geothermal features across the TVZ. And what they're trying to do is delve into understanding the extremophile populations, which are these, cre which are these bugs and bacteria that grow in insanely hot and uh, volatile conditions and understand the nature of their growth and even um, look at understanding potentially how they might be uh, useful for things like mineral um, extraction from geothermal fluids, how they might um, be uh, brought into an economic sense as well. So there's a lot of potential in this project and it's been very interesting. And I think, I believe now they've actually got a comparative project or at least um, some collaboration going with Yellowstone National Park and comparing what they're finding in their biological uh, genomes in New Zealand with what they're finding in Yellowstone National Park, which should be quite interesting. So that's sort of a little sort of snippet of a lot of what um, different people are researching over there. But I'm going to talk a little bit about now what I research. So I'm a structural geologist. Um, and when people ask me that aren't geologists, what that means, it means that I study cracks and rocks, which is not as sexy as saying you're a volcanologist who studies volcanoes or something like that. Uh, and you always get looks when you explain it. 
Um, but essentially what I was doing a lot of in New Zealand was trying to characterize the structure and stress and the relationship between structure and stress and fluid flow in geothermal systems in New Zealand. So essentially I was trying to understand the permeability as it related to the structure of the systems over there. So uh, in ter- if, if permeability for people who aren't maybe familiar with the term is the ability of a rock to channel fluid through it. And it comes in lots of different types of forms. The one uh, that we usually refer to as porosity or intrinsic permeability is just the ability of water or geothermal fluids or whatever it is to move through the spaces in between the grains that make up a rock. But we're interested in more so in the geothermal fields of New Zealand because we're dealing with very hard rocks and very indurated and, uh, and uh, volcanic and crystalline rocks are how the fluids are moving through structures that are either created as these, uh, as these geological units are being emplaced over time or... Um, what, what structures are being generated from things like tectonics or from thermal cooling as you bring stuff close to the surface as, er- as erosion goes on, as you inject and force new material into existing um, litholo- mythologies and uh, what sort of structures you get from um, eruptive and distru- uh, disruptive events like hydrothermal brecciations or uh, geyser explosions or even new volcanic eruptions. So I'm interested in what happens to the rock after it's been laid down in terms of understanding the structures that allow fluids <coughs> excuse me, to move through the systems. Because understanding those structures then leads us to better ways of accessing the uh, geothermal resources, which leads to um, more, uh, more optimized drilling, which leads to less drilling, hopefully, um, because the wells will be performing better, because you've been able to help them target the systems better. It leads to less money being spent by companies, which they love, but it also leads to less um, environmental disruption from drilling practices, for example, which is great. So everyone wins. I'm looking at these structures that they have um, a sort of a a dominant trend to them. Most of them seem to be running northeast, southwest. So again, we're calling back to this larger scale trend I was talking about earlier that's been observed in lots of different ways. So we're still mapping a lot of the faults in the top volcanic zone today. The place is, for lack of a better word, completely shattered. It is riddled with faults at all sorts of scales from the decimeter all the way up to the kilometer scale faults. Um, And we are using more and more um, diverse techniques to do this, anything from remote sensing to uh, looking at lineaments on aerial photographs um, to actually getting dirty and digging up some of these structures themselves with a digger and looking at what shape they take underground and trying to understand when they were active and look for evidence of fluid flow along them. So this is a tren- this are, these are some images of a trenching project we did on an active fault within the TVZ, where we dug, I think it was about a seven meter, eight meter trench through uh, across, across one of these large structures, so we could really get in and get some detail about, what, um, about its, uh, how it's evolved and changed over time. So we do a lot of this sort of stuff on top of the larger scale mapping as well. Um, not only a lot of what we're looking at from those sort of techniques is very much looking at what's happening in sort of the upper part of the crust as well, the very shallow portion, which is great because the shallow portions are probably what's controlling much of the surface expression of geothermal. But if we're drilling on average, um, you know, wells that are three, three and a half kilometers deep, we're more interested then in what are the structures at depth because those are the ones that are controlling the fluid movement at depth. So we're really interested in knowing what orientations they're in so we can drill across as many of them as possible or we're interested to know where the intersections are because where you get faults intersecting, you're more likely to create fluid flow pathways. So again, we've recognized the importance of deep structures in our geothermal systems since the 1950s. And there's been a lot of uh, people have attempted to try and get a handle on what orientations and pathways these structures have at depth. So for example, we have these guys in 1959, Mordernik and Stutt, um, and they were inferring these large scale faults from early gravity and magnetic data. And then again, we combine this with the work of Cochrane and Tianfeng, um, who looked at faults that they inferred from gravity and magnetic data, but also from early Landsat and aerial photos that were taken back in the 80s. So we've been developing this concept of the deeper structures of the top of the connect zone for quite a long time. And we are advancing it even further now with the concept of our three-dimensional modeling. So I showed you a a different example of the three-dimensional modeling earlier. This is one of the Waraki geothermal field. So comparing this to the old maps that Grindley produced back in the 60s, um, we've come a long way in terms of bringing his data forward with us and developing it to understand not just how the structures look at the very surface, but how they might look at three and four or five kilometers depth as well from our modeling. <coughs> what, what, what kind of monitoring network is that? 
that taken from? <sighs> That's a great question. Um, <laughs> we, you know, Northern Ireland, we've, we've kind of got a, a monitoring system at the moment, you know, I know Diane's the one seem to deploy a larger yes. monitoring system. It's um, I think the, the details are, I think, in the, this publication and a couple of other ones as well. I can, I can, I'm sure I can send you copies of them if you want. I do, I do, it is micro seismicity they're measuring, so they are dense yeah, yeah. networks. Yeah. They're not, um, th this isn't stuff they're picking up from the national grid, for example, that, that GeoNet would use. Yeah. This is a, a denser, specifically laid out um, oh, aqua. Yeah. I, 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 I actually don't know if they have any borehole seismometers. I, I'm not sure. I think they might all be surface based. They haven't quite got into that whole borehole seismic, seismic, seismic monitoring thing just yet. But I, yeah, but that, it is a dense network that is local to yeah. specific specific areas in, in the region. So this was the Wyrathy region was covered in this area uh, by a very specifically um, designed network that was in place for a few years, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we have so many earthquakes there. Um, <laughs> it builds a pattern up quite quickly. <laughs> yeah? How are they pressure stable in the wells and the drilling? Do they use drill mortar? They, oh, um, yeah, I would refer you to an amazing guy actually to talk the ear off you about this. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's same with controlling pressure in a lot of drilled wells. I mean, you, yeah, the whole, uh, I, can, I can only think of the acronym BOP. Why can't I think of the actual? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, blood preventers, like all of this, they have all of the infrastructure that's sat on top of the well, just yeah. designed for, um, maybe a little bit more designed for geothermal because of the, the heat and yeah. fluids and stuff as well. But in, t in general, these wells, they're not, even though you're dealing with a kind of similar sort of reservoir, cap rock kind of system, in general, because you're in this extensional setting, you're dealing with um, pore pressures that are generally sitting underneath the hydrostatic. So they're not overpressured. They're underpressured for the most part, actually, at least yeah. slightly. Uh, the, the nature of the drilling actually does it. It's well, I mean, <laughs> they don't like to use the word <laughs> hydraulic fracturing over there. It's essentially what they're doing. I mean, you drill, you're drilling into 300 degrees rock with temp, you know, with fluids that are, you know, somewhere below 100. That thermal shock alone is enough to fracture the vo a volume of rock around the well, okay. probably locally increasing permeability, which is great. Um, thermal uh, hydraulic fracturing. Not so much. I mean, they maybe do it a few times to um, something that I was going to talk about after uh, after I finished was um, I've been doing a lot of recent research into fracture sealing and how the mineral mineralization closes up the structures that allowed the flow. Um, and we've got a lot of research going on in that space at the minute as well. But that's a huge problem for them. So in the vicinity of their wells, all these fracture flow pathways become closed up with quartz and calcite and silica. So what they do is they might frack a well to try and open them up again and get the fluid moving because it can kill a well off in less than a couple of months. So this mineralization is very fast. Um, but generally what they'll maybe prefer to do is like an acid flush or something as well because that strips the carbonate out and then you open up the pathways again. And that. So there's, there's different ways they tackle it, but not so much really in the way we think about, t traditionally think about hydro hydraulic fracturing. Yeah. Any more questions? Great. Okay, well, I think to say thank you to David once again thank you very for much. a wonderful talk. And just before you go, um, we just would like to present you uh, oh. uh, on behalf of the so Geological Survey. Geological <laughs> Survey. It's Brilliant. a souvenir, so to thank you for thank your you. talk. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank it's you a, very much. a super cool pen. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a ruler on it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> on a spirit level, this is great, actually. <laughs> thank you. That's fantastic. Right, thanks again, David. Thank you. Choppy recording, I'm sorry. It's grand, it's grand. <laughs> that was a great talk. It, the geothermal industry is interesting because it goes through similar uh, cycles of boom and bust as petroleum does, and it will depend. Mm -hmm. um, like in the minute, geothermal is really, uh, the geothermal industry is in a bit of a dive, not a dive, but in a, uh, a holding pattern at the minute in New Zealand because electricity price, there's no demand for electricity, the prices are flat, so there's no development at the minute. So um, it really does. The, the, the development of the exploration and utilization is very dependent on lots of economic factors as well. So it could have been another similar sort of thing to, to that, that what we have now. I, I have a similar question on that point, mm -hmm. that the increase in that graph around 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. is there anything positive?
policy related in New Zealand that changed at that time involved maybe some more forward thinking in terms of renewables and the uptake of renewables in general? Not, not that I'm particularly aware of. The ge geothermal policy in New Zealand, I think it, it's not it's not very detailed in lots of different ways. I mean, it's not as heavily regulated or managed as, for example, the petroleum development, um, which are much more heavily uh, regulated with policy. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's nothing yeah, I can think of off the top of my head. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen anything like that yeah. before. Yeah, it, it's quite a remarkable increase. Uh, partly the increase might be due to um, a lot of development in more local use and direct use. Yes which has seen significant increase recently, um, whereas before they had been doing very little direct use type uh, energy uh, with geothermal in New Zealand. So that might be in part what's contributing to the large spike. Um, the electricity might be more of a standard um, growth. Um, and that's the start, Jamie. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the wedge-shaped, um, well, the wedge of, of uh, geothermal mm -hmm. uh, shows um, I imagine that's because there's an asymmetric rip there. Is it unzipping in that direction? Has it? Yeah. The so is the is the southeast more active at the moment or newer? Um, the well, the southeast has the three giant volcanoes yes, <laughs> at the end of it pinning it. The the rifting the, the extension actually continues on past that right out into the, the far coast and off into the Taranaki Basin actually, yeah. which is where a lot of the petroleum developments are hosted. Yeah. Uh, but the, the rift itself, the wedge shape, it is actually spreading faster at the coast than it is at the centre. So you have faster spreading weights due to I think some rotational tectonic forces that are sort of pulling New Zealand in a kind of rotational way yeah. away from the, the subduction plate. Yeah. <coughs> so it's quite it's quite interesting the way that it de it's developed like that. Yeah. And there's a lot of work being done, particularly with those trenching of the faults, mm -hmm. a lot of work being done to do recurrence intervals and structures and develop rates of extension over time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. David, nice to ask you. Thanks. Um, I'm just trying to imagine when you're drilling Uh, <coughs> yeah. When you build a hole, you lower your equipment. Yeah. What, uh, because you showed acoustic and acidity measurements, so mm -hmm. there's no actual images of what it looks like. But do we have an idea of whether the, is it steam? Is it like, what does it look In like? In terms of the fluid itself? The fluid um, itself yeah. It'll vary. I think it varies from field to field. Like I said, sometimes it'll be it'll be single phase fluids like gas, or depending on the temperature and pressure conditions as well, mm -hmm. uh, fluid or or or. Uh, gas component. Most of the time, I think it's um, it's dual phase or multi phase, okay. which is the ga the steam and the yeah. and the fluids. They use separators at the surface to to filter out what we don't want and send what we do want to the, the power stations. Um, we haven't got deep enough or hot enough, I think, to hit supercritical. Yeah. Um, but that would be for now. For now, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you now. if you go a little bit yeah. further, I'd say we'll be dealing with that. And that's what they're really interested in. For example, in Iceland at the minute is this this, this notion of supercritical. I mean, they've just finished drilling into a volcano for God's sake, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's another Sorry. question from the back. Yeah, yeah. It's more historical than a geographical sure. question. I'm really um, intrigued by the idea that they had two dry years and started this. Mm. There, there must have been more of a lead in time. Like, when you're saying they started this whole process of measuring the exploit in this in 1958. Yes, yes. It was two dry years. Yeah. And as an Irishman, I'm very intrigued. <laughs> So was I. I I don't have any more any more sort of um, background knowledge than that. I've, yeah. I have people I could talk to that would tell me because they were there at the time. But uh, I think that was the big kind of push. Yeah. There probably was background chatter about let's oh. let's let's start making the use of these facilities and uh, and and drill a few test sites and stuff. And they were already doing um, sort of geophysical mapping and and surveying of the area anyway. So that was probably part of that build up towards it as well. But I think that was the well, I, from what I understand anyway, that that two year dry spell was a sort of push to actually get them off and developing it. The government then, because I think the original wells were drilled in part, or at least wholly by the, the original DSIR, which is the, the original scientific uh, institute of New Zealand. So it would have been a big government injection of, of um, funds and resources into developing it back then. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, just a quick geological one. If, if when you mentioned supercritical, did any of yeah. the NT studies 
not not that I'm aware of, but uh, you know, yeah, I would definitely refer you to the paper. <laughs> but uh, I can put you in touch with Ted, who would be able to give you more information on that. I haven't um, dealt too much with the with the magnetic works myself, apart from looking at where those angled trends are, because I think they might be identifying large scale um, subsurface faults that are feeding the the shallower systems. Yeah. Mm. It, it's a it's a. It, I mean, if you're thinking along the lines of application here. Mm -hmm. Tad would be the person to talk to. I will put you in touch with him because we've yeah. got a quite a big crust here. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 that's it. Like you, the crust is thinning because you're in that extensional region, yeah. um, and you know the, the, you're obviously pulling that grey wacky basement apart over time um, because it's it's two different. But then it's also two different terrains that were sutured together when it formed anyway. So it's um, I'm not sure what the total estimates of thickness are. There probably are some that have been um, made from various um, other studies. I actually don't know. Yeah, I know. I know that the basement um, is shallower towards the 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 shore than it is towards the centre. So as you go further up to from the the top of Vulcan the top of lake up towards the uh, the basement up towards the um, the Bay of Plenty, uh, you're drilling basement rock. You're drilling grey wacky at a kilometre and a half up at the coast, but close to the volcanoes, you're drilling. You're, you haven't even reached basement with the drilling yet. You're still in the volcanic plastics and the deposits possibly because of proximity to a lot of the calderas that erupted these things at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Did White Island pop up during one night? <laughs> 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 I'm not sure. wake up and they find Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like we've seen a view. I have no yeah. idea, actually. I'm not sure. As far as I know, it's quite... It looks a bit like Southsea as well, like off possibly. Iceland. Possibly. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, it predates... Um, it predates uh, man even being on New Zealand, oh, from okay. what I'm aware, yeah. Oh, right. So okay. uh, yeah, I don't think it's recent. So no it's not recent in terms now. of humanity, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure there are age dates for its formation, though. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. there are. There's no marriage. <laughs> there, there will be. They, they, there's one for everything, and they're all fascinating as well. It's a very interesting and deep mythology, actually, which is quite exciting. Yes. Um, yeah, the lecture we just talked. Not at all. You're grand. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. time. Um, no. um, and I'm going to finish it and just say thank you very much for coming along uh, to the talk today. Um, and uh, yeah, um, thank you for listening to me. Oh, David, thank you so much. No very interesting. Sorry, I uh, way overran, sorry. No, 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 I think uh, it's fair to say this is a very interesting, uh, interesting subject. Uh, I wonder if there's any questions from the floor, if anybody has any questions they want to ask David on some of the technical, maybe some of the less technical things. Yeah, anything, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. You said some of your first slides where you showed the growth of geothermal mm -hmm. in New Zealand, it was a weird like, flip around the year 2000 and then you tailed off for a couple of years. Oh. I'm just wondering if you 